My name is Marty Blazer, and I'm a medical doctor. I got an a MD degree, and I trained in, in medicine and in internal medicine. I studied infectious diseases and, uh, and epidemiology, and then I began a career as a microbiologist. I'm at NYU, I'm a professor of medicine and microbiology, and I began my career by studying pathogens uh, and how they interacted with humans, including their persistence in humans, and that led me into commensals. Uh, and now I mostly study the human microbiome. So I'm Tandy Warno. I did my uh, PhD up the road in Berkeley in mathematics. Um, but I became basically a computer scientist through the work that I did. And I've be been working on evolution ever since I was a graduate student. Uh, and I also work on language evolution. Hi, I'm John November. I'm a population geneticist at the University of Chicago. Um, I came to this field through a combination of being a high school programming nerd and enjoying biology, and then towards the end of undergrad, realizing I could put them together, and, um, and then did a PhD at Berkeley uh, with Monty Slatkin in theoretical population genetics, and then moved more into human genetics in my postdoc. I'm uh, Donna Fair. I um, started uh, with math and computer science and slowly got more and more bio biological to the point where today I call myself a biologist, even though all sorts of NIPs and UAI still invite me to speak there. I'm an imposter there. And um, I jump one of the pleasures of being an academic is I can jump around all sorts of questions, uh, looking at networks, the single, uh, stru tissue structure in single cells, uh, cancer, and why you should become an academic is that you can play in a candy shop of different questions. All right, uh, thank everyone for their introduction. Um, I think we're gonna structure this loosely around half of it. We'll just sort of start with some questions up here and then halfway through we'll turn over the mics to you all. So if you have any questions, please save it for the second half of this session. Um, so we're gonna start off with a question I think Chris has. Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, so for each of you, um, uh, how do you sort of carve out a career that was different from your mentors and the people that um, kind of supervised you as you were growing up? I guess we can go in the same order. Same order. So I, I think uh, I, I have the disadvantage of having gray hair, um, and, um, but the advantage is, is having some experience. And my, uh, my general advice to everyone is to find a problem that you're interested in and follow the problem. You just keep following the problem wherever it leads you. Not necessarily follow a technique, but follow a problem. And that will automatically differentiate you from everyone else, because the problem will take you in all kinds of unexpected directions. And what you will need to solve the problem uh, will give you your career's education. So I have to agree with that. Um, th the main thing is to have a passion. And if you don't have a passion, you're not in the right industry. But if you have a passion, just feed the passion and follow it. It's, it's what makes this all worthwhile. And anyway, being different from your advisor, it, it was not an issue for me because my advisor was really more interested in sequence comparison and I got interested in phylogeny. So it just happened easily for me. It's not always easy for, easy for everyone. Um, so there, are, there is an art to making sure that you have an independent uh, research agenda and that it's not the same thing that you were doing in your PhD work. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah, I think those were, were great comments, and uh, I second them, third them, um, I guess. Uh, let's see, um, for me, with my PhD advisor, I suppose uh, what helped distinguish is I went a little more data-oriented, um, and from my postdoc advisor, maybe, um, the choice of questions versus human population genetics versus statistical genetics. But yeah, in, in general, um, these fields that most of us in are large and there's lots of questions and there's plenty of room. It's a big sandbox. So it's, I don't think it's something to worry about very, very much, uh, um, especially in computation, in, in, you know, the, the, the topic that brings us here. I don't think it's as tight as certain molecular labs where it's a specific, you know, uh, molecular machinery that you're working on and there aren't too many parts in it. Um, even then, there's a lot, so. So again, follow your passion is, is I think the best uh, mm -hmm. advice.
But I think that's one of the advantages of doing both a, a PhD and, and a postdoc, because you get two different mentors, two different points of views, and you get to, to fuse them and build your own thing and then put a little bit of yourself in it. That's what I did. I just recently had a, a wonderful postdoc start in Yale, and she had some great ideas in my lab that were built on her previous field, which was actually some chip design. And I told her, hold off on these. Though that merging of you know, what I do and what you're taking from your pr previous field will be signature you, and don't dare do that in my lab. And, and that merging is, is what will make you unique, and that's what you gain from two mentors. Okay, um, another question I think that people had is, um, what sort of administrative or managerial skills do you think are really important to succeeding in academia that you didn't necessarily learn in your scientific training? Uh, we can go the opposite direction. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the scariest thing is actually dealing with people and people's problems and having someone say, well, you know, my sister is dying of cancer or even the more mundane, my boyfriend broke up with me, which can, can elicit the same extreme ex response. Uh, you know, I've had to deal with depressions of someone maybe potentially being suicide and other lab members breaking down their door because he was non-responsive. And that's the really scary stuff that uh, a postdoc and, you know, PhD is very intense and, and, and you're responsible for people and people have real problems in addition to the work they do in your labs. And, and I think dealing with people's emo emotional problems was the scariest part, or being responsible for their well, personal emotional well-being was the scariest part for me. I think that's uh, yeah, a great point, really true. Um, I'll, I'll take it in a completely different direction to the much more uh, uh, mundane, less uh, life-threatening, emotional stability well, threatening. That was very the, scary. The, um, is just uh, managing time well and managing time for uh, yourself to be a great coach and mentor and have that energy that it takes but then not to be so drained that you can't do your own work and, and, uh, um, and have the kind of deep thinking that's part of this uh, enterprise. So uh, achieving that balance when there's so many different uh, demands on your time has been uh, something I'm still trying to perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, was, um, I, I can't match uh, Dana's uh, experience with, but I do think that Providing direction for your graduate students and helping them to learn how to be effective is really important and really hard. Uh, and, and it's just, on the other hand, it's the best part about being a researcher is the relationships you have with your students and your postdocs. It's, that's really amazing. Um, time management is essential. Uh, it, you won't believe it as a uh, graduate student or as a postdoc, but you have more time now than you will ever have. Uh, faculty have extremely little time. And they go home and they work at home and they work on the weekends and they get in the morning and they wake up and they start working again. I mean, they're spending all their days in, in faculty meetings and not getting their research done. You have more time to do research now and you will have less time later. So you have to learn how to manage your time and you have to take care of yourself. So the things that you do not learn as a graduate student is how busy you're going to be and how you have to protect your, your personal life and your ability to get work done. Uh, <clears throat> three comments. The first is uh, to go back to uh, uh, what was said before. If it's not fun, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. And one of the reasons that we work so hard is that it's a lot of fun. I don't think anybody could get us to work as hard as we do if it weren't so interesting and so enjoyable. So one, think about the fun thing. The second is that a lot of running anything uh, is common sense. And you have to slow down and say, what is the common sense approach to this problem? And remember that it's a small world and you're going to be uh, people are going to remember you for your integrity, for your generosity, or vice versa. So make sure that you pick the right choice there. And the third is that the most important thing you're going to do is that you're going to work with other people. And you're going to have the options to hire people or choose people to be your associates. And that's the most important decision you make, is who's going to work with you? Who are you going to invest your time with? And if you invest in good people, then the work is, is mostly done. And if, the, if you don't choose well, it's going to be much more difficult. And that's, the first thing is to choose good people. The second is to give them the ball to run with it, because good people want to run with the ball. 
And the third is to try to be flexible and keep them as happy as you can. Cool. Um, so another question uh, the, that people were asking, um, so what, what sort of skills or attributes do you look for um, either on someone's CV or in an interview with someone when they're a potential candidate as a, as a postdoc and that sort of thing? I mean, certainly papers and grants and, and that kind of stuff, but maybe some more intangibles um, if you want to start. Uh, I, I look for the same three things in all people. Uh, one is, and not necessarily in, in this order, one is intelligence, how, how, how smart are they? Second is, uh, what's their personality? How, how well will they get along with other people? Are they going to be a joy to work with or a headache? If you're not enjoying the interview, it's not going to get any better. Uh, uh, and the third is evidence of self-motivation. Is this person somebody who loves what they're doing? Are they going to just run and you're just going to help give them direction or do you, you're going to have to pull teeth? And I think everybody uh, of a certain age has, has found people in both groups. Yeah, so that's not, unfortunately, it's not, the personality doesn't show up in your CV all that well. Um, but your research statement, which is somehow supplementary to your CV, can communicate your passion, can communicate what drives you. And so if you are trying to reach people and, and get them to give you a position, make sure that your research statement really communicates your personality. And, and then when you do meet them, make it work. Because the personality is actually very important. Do you want to work with the person or you don't want to work with the person? If you're someone who can only work by yourself, you're not likely to engage other people in giving you positions. I really like those comments. I just add, um, on top of those, I think those are some of my priorities, I would add, um, general curiosity, someone who is clear from the interview that they have broad interests, broad curiosity, that oftentimes speaks for um, how engaged they'll be at chasing down the details in the research, how well they'll work as a teammate and providing feedback to other people, not just focusing on their own projects. So, so I'll add something that hasn't been said and, and for me is very important, innovation and out of the box thinking. I think uh, that's, that's where we make a a big difference, and uh, when screening candidates, yeah, there's many steps. There's looking at the CV for productivity and what they did. There's the recommendation letters, which you know should be good. Don't trust letters. You need to call the PIs. People sometimes vert, you know, lie in letters and will tell you a completely different story on the phone. I've learned. And uh, once you, so when you hire into your lab, the first few people set the tone. And if you're, you know, opening, uh, you really need to get the, the people that will help you then build a bigger group. And these people will help you vet. So my group, we're pretty democratic about who we want to let in. I let them vet them as well as I do because my group sees things that I don't. So that's why a candidate goes through, talks with everyone, and I really listen to, to everyone, you know, how did it go. I also like the candidate to have some of their own ideas but also be flexible to ours, so like the, the interaction, like will, will the person work with others? So it's a whole package deal, but I think innovation and out-of-the-box thinking, if I could choose one trait, that would be at the top. Okay, I think we're about halfway through right now. So we're gonna open up to questions from the audience. If anybody has any questions, can you just raise your hand, um, and then a mic will find you. I think we have one right now uh, up, here, up here. So, um, Professor Blazer may be best place to answer this one, but hard money versus soft money environments. Um, what differs between a successful career in those two different places, you know, sort of a medical school versus being on the main campus in terms of both getting the job in the first place and, uh, and being able to stay there? That, that's a good question. Uh, I'd like to answer it as a biologist. Where, it, where is it better, to live in the desert or live in the tropics? It, it depends who you are. And uh, it depends, you know, one of the rules, I think, is to understand your personality and follow your personality. Hard money selects for a certain kind of individual. Soft money selects for a different kind of, they're different selective strategies. I think it's very important to 
develop when you're, when you're looking for jobs to try to figure out, will I get the resources I need to, be, to have a reasonable chance of success? And most people don't exactly know what that means going in, but you can discuss it with other people, with your mentors and others. Is this package likely that if I'm productive and I do a reasonable job, you know, will, will I make tenure? Uh, uh, I think that's what most people are interested in. And it, you might get some other opinions about this. The only thing I would add to that, because I think your answer was wonderfully nuanced, is um, being successful at getting grants is not easy. And even the people who are successful at it don't get funded every time they apply. So I actually spent a year at NSF and as a program director, and I would see all these fantastic people and how many times they applied and did not get funded. Okay, so it's, and that's true at NIH as well. Um, so you have to be able to learn how to write really um, good grant proposals. No matter where you're sending them, you have to learn how to communicate. You have to learn how to have really good ideas and communicate those ideas to a broad audience and really make them compelling. And the more that you're depending on soft money, the more important it is. So that's, again, it's, it does select for different types of people. Um, but you have to be good at grant writing, either one, but especially good in the soft money side. Oh. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add. Um, I've changed, so I was at UCLA and now I'm at University of Chicago and it's a different balance of uh, system. One, I was in a ecology and evolution department with a nine month appointment at U Chicago. It's human genetics. and. So it's uh, hard money, but as a bigger salary recovery off of grants. But um, there are these trade-offs of how much you're teaching, um, how much, uh, what benefits there are if you raise more grant money than would cover just your three months of summer salary, all these kinds of things. So um, you'll need to decide about your career stage, what your um, energy level you have, uh, and to find the balance. For me, uh, one of the attractions of moving to the University of Chicago was to lower my teaching load and to um, so uh, it comes with a, a higher amount of grant writing, but the field is is going pretty well right now. You know, it's a it's not the um, it's obviously you know the grant writing environment is hard, but it's not impossible. So um, some of these factors are going to play out in your decisions. So money is always a nice thing, and with all all equal, having money is, is is great. But when I was out on the market, and what I and, and for my own postdocs, I say look at the package deal. Unless you're really asking basic science questions that would really be hard to get funded, um, I think your environment, um, who are your collaborators, what are your core facilities, what is your access to what students, what's the whole package deal, <coughs> will matter a lot more than um, whether you have hard or soft money. And I took a hard position only because I wanted to be right next to the engineering building and attract so many quantitative students. Um, and I felt that at the med school, which for us is uh, 50 blocks away, uh, I wouldn't get the quantitative students needed. But it wasn't about the hard money. It was about having engineering next door. It's not like in this campus where they're across the street. Um, my postdoc, you know, I, I told her to take the soft money position because there are options for, for collaborations and for data and for scientific stimulus would have been so much better that I think that she would succeed better there than in a position with hard money. So unless you're really a nervous person, look at the full picture and at the environment. With all else equal, yeah, money is nice, but environment is key. All right, we have time for one more question, if anybody has another question. Hi, my question would be, how did you personally manage this transition between being a graduate student, being a postdoc, and becoming a PI? I don't know if it, because it's a big change in your everyday life, I guess. And so how did you prepare yourself to do that? Luckily, in part, it happens in stages, and uh, I'm very nostalgic for the very beginning of my faculty position, where the first recruits to the lab hadn't arrived, and you sort of, you have time to, you know, um, uh, you know, 
I was finishing out some papers, writing grants, recruiting, and then the first one comes, and the second, and, and it ramps up. And so it's not overnight that you have the lab of, of uh, you know, seven, eight people. Um, I heard one great uh, comment about mentoring, that if you took any, uh, any of us from here at sea level in Palo Alto and dropped us off at, uh, you know, a thousand feet down the ridge from the top of Mount Everest, we'd immediately collapse, right? And, and uh, it'd be a very painful thing. But, you know, if you get there step by step, you can make it all the way to the top. And that that's what's happening. When you see super successful full professors juggling all these committee assignments, editorial duties, students, large grants, they've gotten there step by step. And each way you're learning all of the, you're like refining these habits. So like writing, writing your first grant takes a lot of time. Writing your next one takes a little bit less. Same with letters of recommendation. Same with, you know, there's so many tasks that you just become more efficient at and it, and it becomes doable, so. so. I, I think I just want to say that, um, it is, an environment actually makes up for a lot. So if you're in an environment with people that you want to collaborate with, all of these things become easier to do. You find yourself going from graduate student to postdoc and having a great postdoc. You go from postdoc to faculty and it's daunting and it's scary, but you know, if you have people to work with, you suddenly discover it's not as scary as you think. So you really, it's the environment. If you have an environment that's stimulating, go for it. When you have choices between places and some of them are really stimulating and you're gonna have great people to talk to and they do talk to each other, go for it. And then the things that seem like they're gonna be too hard to do, they're not gonna be that hard. But just surround yourself with people that you want to work with and, and everything will become easier. I, I wanna say that in a career, especially here in the United States, there are a lot of different career options. And it turns out that there's selection at every stage and people opt for different pathways. And not everybody goes the pathway that we've chosen. People uh, make different choices, but uh, everybody's here is kind of on the same track. I wanna just say one last thing that someone mentioned earlier, and that is you really, everyone has to work on their communication skills. Your written and your verbal communication skills, it's just, it's critical in science. Yeah, so I mean, I actually do think it's a, a big leap from postdoc to faculty. For me, it was um, very scary. And first and foremost, you have to have a vision, and you have to believe in your vision and believe in yourself. That's sort of what gets you through it. Um, for me, the hardest switch, and maybe that's because of in, in environment, was I came out of a very, very, very active and collaborative and, 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 and phenomenal postdoc lab. And suddenly I was all alone, and first I just felt lonely um, and scared. But in the end, uh, you have to believe in yourself, and you build your, fill up your lab, and it's the best feeling in the world. Cool. Well, uh, let's all give a round of applause for the panelists today.